When it comes to 2D games, side-scrollers are pretty much your bread and butter. Platformers, Metroidvanias, Hack and Slash, Run and Gun. In terms of genres and gameplay, there is a lot of variety with side-scrollers. And for the beginners out there, these types of games can be quickly set up, and they're pretty simple to understand, making a 2D side-scroller incredibly approachable. One element that's shared across all these different genres? Movement. For a side-scroller to work, you need to be able to move your character. Player movement in general is usually where you start making your game anyway, making this the logical first step for your project. So that's going to be the focus of this Unity tutorial. And in just a few minutes, we'll have set up the foundation of player movement in your game to build off of using only one script and one sprite. It's going to be really easy. Let's get started. To start, we need a brand new 2D Unity project, which I opened up here. And the first thing we want to do is import our player sprite. So we want to go down into our assets folder and right click, select import new asset and select our player sprite that we want to use. I'll be using a white rectangle that's 128 by 256 pixels. And we'll just drag that into the scene. When you drag a sprite into the scene, it creates a game object and we'll use this object as our player. So let's click on our new object go to the name and change it to player. While we're here, I'll change the tag to player as well. And the next thing we wanna do is create a floor for our player to stand on. So we'll drag in our sprite again to create a new game object and we'll name this game object floor. We'll rotate it 90 degrees on the Z axis so it becomes flat and we'll scale it on the Y axis so it becomes larger than our camera. From here, we can use the move tool to move the floor towards the bottom of the camera. On our floor object, I'll go in and change the color to green to make it look more like a landscape, which is pretty much programmer art at its finest. At this stage, we're still just sketching out what we want our scene to look like, so we can hit the play button and preview what we've done so far. Really quickly, I'm gonna go into the main camera and change the background color to a lighter blue. You don't have to, I think it just helps make the scene look a little bit better. We can now worry about adding a platform for our player to jump onto. If we click on our floor object and duplicate it with control D, we can go into this duplicated object and rename it to platform. We'll reduce the scale on the Y axis back down to one, move it up a little so we can see what we're working with. Set the color to your preference. I went for the classic Mario brown block look. We'll scale it back up a little bit so we have a larger platform to land on. And finally, we'll just move it over to a place that makes sense within our scene. Not bad, but I do think it looks a little bit too large and the screen's a little cluttered. So I'm gonna go into the sprite that we imported and click on it, and I'm gonna go to the pixels per unit field and increase that from 100 to 150. And since all game objects use this one sprite, we'll see them all adjust when we hit apply. You can play around with this with your own sprites, but for mine, you'll notice that everything in the game view looks a little bit smaller, which I like personally. With that out of the way, we can now click on our player and look at the components that we already have. You'll notice because we're in a 2D project, it defaulted with a transform and a sprite renderer. If we wanna do physics-based movement though in 2D, then we'll need a rigid body 2D. This will handle things like gravity, mass, friction, etc. So when we apply forces to our player, it will know how to calculate it. We also wanna add a component that will handle collisions for us. So we'll add a box collider 2D. I'm using a rectangle, so a box collider fits my shape, but you might have to use something different. And if I disable my sprite here, you'll notice these new green lines surrounding my rectangle. These lines will detect collisions with any other colliders you have in your scene. So if we preview this by hitting play, you'll notice that our player actually just falls right through the floor. The good news is our rigid body is applying gravity, but our collider isn't detecting any collisions. This is because we didn't add colliders to any of the other objects in the scene. So if we select our floor and platform and add a box collider 2D, and we disable our sprite renderer, we'll notice that we have our bounding boxes appear on these two objects. And so if we try again, we should now notice that our player sticks the landing. Cool, now that we've set up a scene for ourselves to work in, we can actually get started making our player move around. The first thing we need to do is to create a new c -sharp script called, you guessed it, Player Movement. With our script created, we can actually drag it onto our player object. And if we go onto our player object and collapse all the other components, we'll notice that our player movement script has been attached. We can then open this up in Visual Studio or the IDE of your choice. And to get started scripting out our player movement, the first thing we'll need is a couple of variables. The first one being a public float move speed. And since this is a public variable, we can actually use the Unity editor to tweak this value on the fly. Next, we're going to need a reference to the rigid body we attached to our player earlier. So we need a private rigid body 2D RB. And finally, we also need a private bool 
facing right, and we'll default that to setting true. If you actually look at a scale, heading to the left is usually negative and to the right is positive. So by convention and game development, we face right as the default. And if you're new to Unity, you'll notice that the script auto-generated a start and update method. These are what are known as lifecycle methods. I'm not gonna cover these in too much detail, so just follow along if you're not familiar with these. But we're going to need a different lifecycle method called awake. So if we start typing void awake, IntelliSense will help us out and we just need to hit tab to autofill the method for us. To summarize really quickly, our update method will be called every single frame. So if we're running at 60 frames per second, update will be called 60 times a second. The start method gets called before the first update frame. So as long as your game object and script is enabled, this will be called as soon as the scene starts basically. Awake on the other hand gets called before the start method while all the objects are being initialized. This makes the awake method a great place to do any component referencing as opposed to the start method. You might not notice with just a few game objects, but once you start having hundreds in your scene, you'd notice a real slowdown during runtime. So with that said, within our awake method, what we want to do is do rb equals get component of rigidbody 2d. This will search our game object for rigidbody 2d, which we did attach earlier, and store it in our variable for reference. And why we want this is because we want to be doing physics-based movement, and we need our rigid body to be able to do that. Let's get rid of our start method, because we don't need it now, and we can get started actually making our player move. It's always a good idea to plan out what you want to do logically. So for our problem here, what we want is to get the player inputs of pressing keys or using their joystick, and then we want to take those inputs and actually make our player move from them. So starting with getting our player's inputs, we need a new private variable that we'll call private float move direction. In our update, we can then say move direction equals input dot get axis horizontal in string quotations. This will return a float on a scale of negative one to one. So left is negative one and right is one. With our inputs being captured, we can now use our rigid body and set the velocity equal to a new vector two and in the X, we'll use our move direction we're capturing and multiply that by our move speed. And for the Y value, we'll just set whatever the rigid body's current velocity in that direction already is. So going back into the editor, we can click on our player object. And you'll notice we have a move speed variable on our player movement script, which was because we made the variable public. So I'll set that to five and we can actually go ahead and try this out. So I'll hit play. And now if we hit A or D or left and right arrow keys, you'll notice that our player is actually moving left and right. And since that variable is public, we can tweak this. So if we make it 20, you'll notice we move much faster. And if we bring it back down to one, we move very slow. One thing I wanted to point out for those of you new to the input system in Unity is that we hard-coded this string horizontal. So where you can find this is if you go into the editor and go to edit, project settings, and the input tab, here you'll find a list of different inputs, including the one named horizontal. And if you expand horizontal, you'll see that it contains left, right, A, D, and also joystick commands for handling horizontal movement. And so basically what you're doing is you're setting up a dictionary of inputs with the key being whatever you name it, so in this case horizontal, and then all these different input types will register to that. Unity by default gives you a couple of these, including jump, which we'll use later. And you can also create your own or modify the existing ones however you'd like. The next thing we're going to look at is flipping our character left and right as we move. In hindsight, I should have added some visual indicator as to which way my character is facing. <coughs> so this is me distracting you while I'm fixing that problem right now. I bet you didn't even notice. So we're going to add a new section to our update called animate. And to do this, we want to create a private method. So we'll do private void flip character. And in here, it's actually very simple what we want to do. We want to take our facing right variable and set it to its inverse. And then we want to take our transform and rotate it 180 degrees in the Y axis. And that's it. From here, we can call our flip character method in our update, but we need to put some conditionals around it. So if our move direction is greater than zero and we're not facing right, so we're facing left, then we flip our character. Otherwise, if our move direction is less than zero and we're facing right, then we wanna flip our character to the left. So if we go into our editor and hit play, then we should notice when we move left and right that our character is now flipping. Isn't it beautiful? 
Really quickly, since our update method's already broken down into three easy steps, I'm gonna use a little keyboard shortcut of control period to extract each one of these steps into their own methods. It just refactors the code to make it a little more readable. If you're new to programming, you should get into the habit of this because it'll save you a lot of pain in the long run. With refactoring out of the way, we can now focus on our last hurdle of this video, which is going to be jumping. With jumping, we need to consider a couple of the challenges. We need to be able to process a player input similar to movement, which then will trigger a force to throw our player into the air. We also need to consider when the player lands to be able to jump again. And if you want to do something like Mario, where you jump into blocks with your head and you cause mushrooms to grow, then we need to be able to identify what the head of our player will be. You don't want to be causing mushrooms to grow with your feet. That would be disgusting. So coming back into our player movement script, we need a new variable that we can configure. So we'll make a public float jump force. And we also need to keep track if we're jumping currently. So we need a private bool is jumping and we'll default that to false. We'll go down into our process inputs method and we'll do a check to see if our input dot get button down jumping quotation marks and we'll set is jumping to true. In our move function, we'll say if is jumping, then we'll use our rigid body to add a force of a new vector two with zero in the X direction and our jump force in the Y direction. Finally, we want to set is jumping to false at the end of our move function. So now that we're applying forces, and we were using velocity, but we're doing a lot of 2D physics in our method here, we actually don't want to be doing this in our update method. Unity has another lifecycle method called fixed update. So we want to actually take our move method and move it from update to fixed update. There's kind of a lot going on underneath the hood, and it's a larger topic than I can cover in this one video. But if you're doing any physics handling, fixed update is better for this because it can be called multiple times per update frame. Whereas you want to keep update kind of strictly limited to inputs and drawing things to the screen. The short summary you need to take away from this is if you're doing physics calculations using your rigid body, then put that in your fixed update method. Back to our game view, we can actually start jumping around with the spacebar. Some of the problems we're still facing is you can press space indefinitely and launch yourself out of the scene, and we also want to identify what the head of our sprite is so we can jump into things. The solution to these are both very similar. We need a ceiling check and a ground check. So we'll go back into Visual Studio, and we're going to need a public transform ceiling check as well as a public transform ground check. We can then go back into the editor and right click on our player object and select create empty. This will create a new game object that's a child of our player. And the only thing it will have is a transform. We can then rename this to ceiling check and we'll use the move tool to drag this up near the top of the player sprite. We then wanna do the same thing, create a new empty object on our player and rename it to ground check and drag it towards the bottom of our player. We can then click on our player and under our player movement script, drag the ceiling check object to the ceiling check variable and drag the ground checked object to the ground check variable. In our script, we're going to need one more variable. We need a public layer mask ground objects. And back in the editor, we'll notice that this appears on our player movement script. And if we expand the dropdown, we'll see all these different entries in a collection. This actually maps to the layers you can assign an object. So in the top right here, if we expand this, we can select add layer. And from here, we can actually enter a new one that I'll call ground. Let's then select our floor and platform objects and assign them this new layer of ground. Back on our player, we can expand the dropdown again and make sure that ground is the only thing selected. Now that we know what type of objects are considered the ground, we need to go into our fix update method and actually check to see if we are grounded. With this check, we'll be able to make sure we're only able to jump again after we've come back down to the ground. And if I say ground anymore, I'm gonna lose my mind. But I already recorded this, so I have to say it. So just know that these are the things that I do for you. To perform this check, we need two more variables. So we need a private bool is grounded, as well as a public float check radius. Then within our fix update method, we could set our is grounded equal to physics 2D dot overlap circle. And for our point, we want to use our ground check position. For our radius, we want to use our check radius. And for our layer mask, we want to use our ground objects variable we set before. Now in our process inputs method, we just want to add end is grounded to our if statement. If we go into our game, we should now notice that when we jump, we're not able to jump again until we come back down to the ground. And at this point, you might want to stop, but it just takes a few more lines of code to be able to configure double jumping, triple jumping, however many jumps you want. So let's tackle that really quickly. 
Back in our script, we need to add our final two variables. We need a private int jump count, as well as a public int max jump count, which will be configurable. We then need to bring back our start method that we deleted earlier. And in our start method, we simply just want to set the jump count equal to max jump count. In our move method, after we've applied our jump force, we want to decrement our jump count. In our fix update, we want to say if is grounded, then we want to set our jump count equal to max jump count as well. And then in our process inputs method, instead of end is grounded, we want to say end jump count is greater than zero. So if the spacebar is pressed and our jump count is greater than zero, then we can jump. We can then go in the editor and set our configurable jump count. And when we hit play, we should be able to jump as many times as we specified, which is awesome. I know we worked hard to get to this point, but there's still two quick bugs we need to clean up before we can say we're done. It'll take a matter of seconds. Watch. Our first bug, if the player runs and jumps into a platform, you'll notice that they actually get stuck. But this is such an easy fix. You just need to go to your assets folder and right click and go to create, and we'll create a new physics material 2D. At this point, you just need to click on your player and drag that material onto your rigid body's material field. That's it. Done. Second bug. If you jump and you clip your player on like a platform or any other collider, you'll actually start rotating and spin around. This is even easier. You just need to go to your rigid body 2D and open up the constraints section and make sure next to freeze rotation, the Z checkbox is checked. And that's it. You're done. what I tell you? Just a few seconds. We now have a basic 2D side-scroller player movement script that can move left and right and also jump, which is pretty awesome. There's definitely a lot of fine-tuning you can do from here, which I can show in some future videos, but this is a great starting point. If you like this tutorial or you have any questions at all, leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you. If this video helped you out, then give it a like, because that helps me in the video out. Oh, and one last thing. If you're looking for more game dev tutorials, be sure to... <laughs>